Coming up on today's episode, NASA announces its landers for the Artemis program, and that includes Starship. There's some new UFO footage and some Tesla earnings calls, and Elon Musk is losing his mind, and Michael Moore hates green stuff now. So let's just get ludicrous. Hey there, and welcome to Our Ludicrous Future. This is the podcast where we talk about all the cool future stuff that's going to make tomorrow crazy so that today we'll just have to get by. I'm uh, Joe Scott with the Answers with Joe YouTube channel. With me is Tim Dodd. Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. I haven't slept at all. I haven't either. I'm on like three hours of sleep, so this is going to be a fun one. Hey, yeah. hey welcome we're, to we're my the Ben Sullivan past performing. five years of life. Welcome, welcome. I'm a dad. Uh, dad never sleep once. <laughs> ben Sullivan. No, that's... That's not true. Since my uh, second kid was born, I've slept every single night almost. So my wife is amazing like that. The first one, though, no, it was brutal. It was a lot of <laughs> sleepless nights. Well, also, we have uh, our wonderful <laughs> patrons in our Discord channel. Hey, guys. How are you guys doing? It's been I a see crazy Mary. Ooh. I see Greg. I see Trevor. I see England and France and someone's Chad on the and pants. Armand and, and <laughs> Armand and, and, and Musty. Chad, Sean, everybody, all the cool people, all the cool kids here. Erday Astron, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> but we have a lot to talk Bam. about this week. I feel like a ton of random things. Like you even mentioned a, a documentary. I have no idea. What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so Michael Moore, the provocateur, yeah. documentarian, uh, very lefty kind of guy. Uh, he produced a film, and I, I don't have the director's name in front of me, but the, he produced a film called Planet of the Humans. I guess it was supposed to come out in theaters, but since theaters are closed, they just released it on YouTube. Um, and uh, it's generated a lot of... So let, let's just get out of the way real quick. I haven't seen it. I've been busy. Uh, we talked about it beforehand. You guys haven't seen it. So I'm only mm -hmm. basing this off of reactions that I've seen. So there's a big, there's a big caveat there. But uh, apparently he's... He kind of rails against wind and solar and mm -hmm. says that um, that they're actually more damaging to the environment. He goes against EVs and eventually basically kind of goes into a Malthusian, we need to get rid of a bunch of people uh, kind of attitude about hmm. halfway through is what I've heard. He's, he's is that what like, Malthusian means? Because I'm trying to decipher what you just said. Uh, okay, so I did a video <laughs> when the uh, Avengers Infinity War movie came out uh, uh -huh. where you know Thanos wants to re get rid of half the population because he thinks that's what's going to save the universe um, uh -huh. Thomas Malthus was a philosopher in like the 17 somethings that um, basically made the same conceit so it's called a Malthusian idea Got it. because mm. of that but yeah um, what's well, a bold stance to have I feel like these days like <laughs> I mean it's not necessarily wrong but it's also not wrong like you know drinking bleach will kill viruses in you <laughs> right like, well but right. it's wrong in the sense that whenever there have been let's say you know black deaths and plagues and stuff that have wiped out a big percentage of the population it bounces right back pretty quickly and you're right back where you started yeah so Unlike drinking bleach, that you don't bounce right back. From you that, don't. So don't do that. Right. You just bounce a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> down the stairs that you were just not back chugging on top of. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, we need to watch uh, this. We have, well, we have a ton of, of news to cover, right? <laughs> like a lot of news. Some some of the well, biggest like, news. News. <laughs> news to news. cover. It's really good news. <laughs> uh, obviously, you know, if you guys are uh, listening to this, we do also have a highlights channel. If you just want to catch little blips of news. Uh, you can go to youtube.com slash OLF highlights. Uh, if you just want your little your little snippets and share those with a friend if there's a topic that you're extra excited about. So like if you got I, something busy, something to do, place to be. <laughs> yeah. You know, you can't sit here for three hours with us. Fine. 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 Okay. We don't need you. Go there instead. Go. Just can go. I just go watch the highlights channel instead of recording? <laughs> <laughs> Joe just I'm reacts go to there it like right two now. days later and then comes back in and we edit him in somehow. That's what we need is a reaction channel to our channel. Where we react to our, our, our last episode. Our ludicrous reactions. Yeah. Could you do that? Like, uh, so I just, I think, Joe, you sent us that video from Graham Stephan. Is that how you say his name? And it was super interesting. And then he had a thing where he was reacting to a reaction that PewDiePie had of a oh. video that he happened to be in or something. 
And I'm like, what? This is like Inception. He's like four layers mm-hmm. in. Can we just keep doing that? Like, I can have a reaction <laughs> to Tim's video. He can have a reaction to Joe's video. Joe can have a reaction to my, <laughs> reac- my reaction of Tim's video. Yeah. And we could just go around in a circle doing Speaking nothing but this reactions, forever. Speaking of reactions, look at NASA, what they did. They did some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, Tim's like I have stuff to talk about, guys. I'm this sorry. Is really this is this is maybe talk the biggest stuff. news. This is maybe the biggest news that's ever happened in my career covering spaceflight. So this is seriously, this is insane. So, so did you guys see that commercial with the guy <laughs> that? No, I'm just kidding. I hate you so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here we go. This is this is why I'm excited. This is why I stayed up all night last night. Um, so NASA, uh, it came out this week that NASA was going to be announcing the actual lunar landers for the Artemis program. Of course, if we want to go back to the moon by 2024, maybe one of the most important aspects of that would be the lander. So you can, you know, oh, get to the moon. Oh, you want to land on the moon. <laughs> because don't forget, SLS and Orion can only get astronauts to the moon and get into lunar orbit. There's still, there hadn't been anything. I mean, there had been proposals and stuff um, to p- put people on the moon. But we didn't know what NASA was going to do. We A lot of us assumed there'd be one, maybe two contractors would win a bid. But the cool thing is this is a fixed price contract, just like the commercial crew program. Um, but what NASA ended up doing blew everyone away and completely ruined my 75 minute long video that I've been working on for two months. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so remember how I'm doing NASA or SLS versus Starship? Well, guess what? They chose Starship as a lunar lander. What? That's they like an chose. old version of it too. Starship. This is actually a new version. It looks like they'll probably paint it for reflectivity or something. We got a lot to talk about. It has no fins. Yeah. Oh, this is because a new it's one. Only a lunar lander. Holy crap! Huh. All right, yeah. All right. So, so what? This can why can't they just jump out of that thing? Come on. You don't need <laughs> so elevator. let me give you guys a rundown. Three different companies, uh, all three different programs, won contracts. And these are so far um, just for the next year. By the by, basically February-ish of 2021, each of, these, um, each of these things will have to have really, really detailed assessments, including how they'll actually get there, really detailed um, plans and blueprints and, um, and business proposals and the actual dollar amounts for everything. But, but NASA is giving them um, the green light to go ahead and basically investing another billion dollars into these three companies. And those three companies are Blue Origin with their national team that includes Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Grumman and, and Draper. And what it is is Blue, or- Blue Origin has the lander portion. Um, Lockheed Martin has the ascent module that would actually you know return astronauts from the surface of the moon back up to um, Gateway or back up to Orion to get back home. And uh, Northrop Grumman has this transfer stage that gets from lunar orbit up to Gateway orbit. And Draper has the, they're developing some of the software and some of the logistics in that sense. Really, really cool. This is a very safe uh, proposal, really kind of down the middle. The one that surprised, I think, honestly, as much as Starship was Dynetics has this, a robust team of more than 25 subcontractors. Look at this like bread loaf, uh, miniature dachshund landing on the moon you know this is a, <laughs> a a belly lander a lot of people are calling it where it would land really low to the moon so you don't have to have the crew module super high up with these large tanks um offset to the sides pretty unique system and it has there's 25 subcontractors working on this um and and dynetics is is the lead on it and they put all this team together which is a really cool way to do things. And I don't know. I think that's probably, that was probably pretty attractive to have that many contractors on it so that, um, you know, those would spread throughout the states and and help um, make it more appealing to Congress and things like that too. Um, But then of course, like I said, SpaceX won, uh, won a bid as well. They didn't win everything, they won a bid. Um, And actually SpaceX won the least amount of money. I should probably pull that up here um, because I had that breakdown here real quick. it goes like this, SpaceX one, uh, do, 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 where was that? SpaceX won 135 million for the next year's development. Uh, Dynetics won 253 million and Blue Origin won 579 million. So I think kind of what that tells me, and I'm sorry, I'm on no sleep and I listened to the press conference that was really hard to hear on a telephone conference. So um, some, of, some of my, what I say now might outdate itself a little bit, but what it appears to me is that space is that NASA has the most faith in 
Blue Origin as being the ride that will probably get them there safely by 2024. So don't forget a lot of a lot of what NASA is doing. This is actually the more I look into this, and I'm really glad that I happen to be going down this rabbit hole already, because the more I look into this, the more I realize NASA is learning and shifting with the times and trying to not make mistakes from previous administrations and previous programs. So what they're doing is they're setting such an ambitious goal and fast tracking so many things that it'll finally be hard to cancel. And there'll be multiple revenue, multiple streams, multiple landers, multiple contractors. So many people roped into this that there'll be so much vested interest that it will finally actually happen. <laughs> like, finally, you know, we've wanted, I've wanted us to go back to the moon my whole life as long as I've wanted. I've wanted to see, know that I'm living on earth while there's people walking on the moon and they're making it happen. And this is a really cool way to do it, which is basically we're going to get astronauts to lunar orbit with SLS and, and Orion because it's done. It's literally certified. All of the hardware is built for the first uncrewed and we're on track to have another one ready to go with humans by 2023. And then 2024, we can land on the moon. Um, so we'll get basically NASA will get the astronauts to there. Then the commercial partners will have lunar landers. And and in my opinion, they invested the least in Starship because Starship is kind of pretty. If Starship lives up to its promise, it'll be the cheapest way to deliver it anyway. <laughs> so SpaceX could, in theory, deliver this huge lunar lander for like hilariously, hilariously cheap um, hmm. and win contracts based on that. But it's also kind of a it's kind of a Hail Mary. Starship's just absurd altogether. So there's a lot of moving parts that have to be figured out, like in fuel reorbiting. Um, the lander itself has auxiliary gas thrusters on top to to be able to do the soft lunar landing because we've talked about before how there's concerns about huge dust craters and all this stuff being kicked up from a massive vehicle like Starship. So there's a lot of other technologies that that um, make it kind of the riskier choice or at least the um, short term risk but long term reward. Um, yeah, that's hmm. uh, which is which is pretty cool. What's so, that money for? Because it all seems like really, really tiny amounts compared to what's needed. It's so it's mostly to really like hundred and finalize. something million is like. Well, I mean, it's enough to really, really, really draw out your system and do all the engineering, like proper engineering, not just like, you know, I don't know, not just like uh, proposals or, you know, like paper rockets, but to actually say, hey, here's the engineering Here's the exact engine we'll use. Here's the exact this, 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 this. Really draw it out, really have it detailed, and then be submitting that next year as their bid, their proper bid then for the proper contracts, really. Okay, so, right. So this is yeah. like, you're. Uh, we're going to pay you to get us a bid. Yep. And, and right. with potential that NASA could buy all three. They could still procure all mm. three contracts. Um, but this way, at least they, they have multiple good options, multi-path that are not redundant or not you know reliant on each other to, to do this. So the odds of them actually having a lunar lander ready by 2024 with three people competing really hard for these bids, I think is really cool. And yeah, what do you guys think? Is this the first thing that Blue Origin has um, bid with NASA? Um, maybe I, there might be some stuff that Blue Origin's already won with NASA, just in, with New Glenn for orbital things. Um, oh, okay. but as far as I know, this is definitely like the, scheduled launches, even though it hasn't gone right, up. right, because they've actually won a lot of they have a lot of contracts in the works, um, including yeah. I think even military contracts, or they're they're vying to try to get military contracts. But yeah, the, it's it's some legit stuff. Yeah. yeah, you yeah. know, as, as excited as, as we get about SpaceX and as fun as it, as it is to watch Starship going through all the, the rigor and everything, when Blue Origin just like pops up with a new Glenn out of nowhere someday, that's going to be so amazing. <laughs> like yeah. we're all just going to be like, what? Yeah. Like I, I'm just, I, I'm really looking forward to that whenever that happens. And I, and I agree, especially again with this video that I had done, um, I, I kind of, I, <laughs> I, I know for a fact that Starship will work, but I know that there's so many unknown unknowns mm. that mm. I can just see some, because it relies on a lot of untested, mm. never done before things in order to fully utilize, you know, realize its full potential. So that might not happen until like 
late 2020s. You know, look at how long it's taken. Look at how long it took just to get Falcon Heavy going. Look at how long it's taken just to get Dragon Capsule going. Um, relatively easy things. You know, I'm using air quotes for those of you listening, <laughs> but because um, I don't think anything in space flight's ever easy. But those are things that had been done before. And Starship is looking at two or three technologies that literally have never really been tried and there's nothing physically impossible about them but they are going to be extremely difficult things that that could make that potential just a little bit further out so i'm glad that we have a more traditional um maybe more conservative bids from the other companies to to lead up to that too are they gonna have to send one up land it on the moon and bring it back without people before they can put people on it so they what they'll do um they won't be bringing this one back at all this one is only going to be like a lunar tug it'll go from the surface oh, of the so moon. it's a lander it's not a returner it's not a returner they'll the crew will still return on orion and the crew sure. will still get to the moon on orion and they'll get home from the moon on orion because all of that technology is literally done and tested <clears throat> you know orion tested its heat shield in 2014 it's from a from orbit you know like a full-blown flight it's ready to go for lunar missions and nasa if they want to get their astronauts safely to the moon uh it, it actually all makes sense and it's this beautiful puzzle that i'm like they actually did something really different they have so many options that will get them to the moon safely will get them potentially to the moon actually by 2024 or 2025 but it'll definitely be far enough along that it won't get canceled you know, because a lot of those checks will be written now mm. so that we can actually get to the moon. And then they have things in progress to make it so we can stay on the moon, that we can mm. really have habitats and people as science experiments, all these big, cool things on the surface of the moon. So the Starship oh. wouldn't actually be coming to and from Earth. It would just be up there at the moon being a shuttle between the gateway and the moon. For for what NASA is procuring from them now, yes. This version of it. This version. And yeah. so it'll be a kind of a special lunar only version. It would still get there with super heavy. You know, they'll still use a super mm -hmm. heavy booster to loft it and, you know, get it out to the moon. Once it's on the moon, it will have to be able to refuel itself. So that might be something that NASA and, you know, the, there are a lot of companies and a lot of these development programs, especially with Eclipse missions, the commercial lunar program services, they're working on refueling techniques and they're working on in situ resource utilization. So that will be part of basically how this all works. And the cool thing is kind of like when SpaceX was, was trying to recover boosters during the CRS missions, learning how to land rockets, you know, in the early 2013, 2014 era. Now they're getting to test out portions of Starship and testing out in situ resource utilization and getting paid to do it <laughs> because it's also functioning as something else while they work on the full thing. And eventually, you know, once once this is all kind of going and Starship's reliably doing this portion of it, eventually, you know, SpaceX could, oh, look, you guys, we trust your, your ascent. Let's skip SLS and Orion. We'll just stick our astronauts up on Starship and you can just go straight from Starship to the moon and no big deal. But like no rush, why rush that out? And why rely on all those systems to actually get you there? <laughs> you know, rely on all these like risky ascent with no abort, risky refueling process, risky landing on the moon's thing, blah, 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 risky re-entry with Starship when they have a solution now that's ready to go and actually paid for. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's interesting. Yeah. So. Uh, okay, when I hear the, the Blue Origin lander is three stages, which still kind of confuses me, actually, but it's a three stage and there's a different company building each stage. Mm -hmm. That feels like extra complexity to me. Is that an unfounded concern in your mind? Um, complexity, yes. I mean, they'll, they'll have to be basically pieced together on orbit and eventually pieced right. together at Gateway, but they could probably be pieced together on their own and likely pieced together from two or three launches even. So likely, you know, the ascent stage and that transfer stage will be one launch on like a new Glen and that lander stage will be another launch on a new Glen because that's yeah. how big these pieces are. These are heavy 30 plus ton landers. So twice as heavy as the Apollo minimum. Some of them 45, Starship 120 tons. Like these are huge vehicles, um, way bigger than the 16 ton Apollo lunar lander. Um, and these rockets that would be launching them, 
including Starship, or I mean SLS, are even are actually less powerful than the Saturn V or less capable. So it's going to take multiple rockets to get these pieces out there. Yes, then they assemble them. But the cool, th the, the biggest reason is um, where Gateway will be and where uh, Orion can park is in this orbit called the near rectilinear near rectilinear halo orbit. Mm -hmm. And it's just a very, it's, it's a low delta V. It's about as low a delta V as you can get to the moon in and stay around the moon. It's a very low um, delta V intense lunar orbit. So then to get from there, you have to still spend uh, like another, I don't, I don't remember, like 2,800 or something or 3,000 um, or meters per second to get down to the surface of the moon. So that's, so basically they'll use that transfer stage. That's one stage, kind of like just like staging from, from earth. You use one stage to do one portion of your journey, another stage that's more optimized for that. So the transfer stage can get it down into lower lunar orbit. That transfer stage goes back up to gateway, refuels and is ready for the next lander. The lander then has the descent and ascent stage. The descent stage will go down, land, probably be, uh, at first at least, the only part that's not reused. And then the ascent stage will be able to get them back up to Gateway and be refueled and blah, 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 blah. But eventually, um, there's potential that they could refuel the descent stage on the moon as well someday and have a fully reusable, some kind of really cool reusable system. Well, I still think eventually that it's going to have to be fully reusable or it's just going to be a whole bunch of like descent stage landers just like dotting the landscape down there. And, you know, yeah, yeah, they're going to have to do something with that eventually if there's going to yeah. be a long term lunar base solution, you know. Well, how cool would it be, though, if there is just like a junkyard of descent stages. <laughs> so now we got junk, so we're pirates. junking up. Yeah, we're, we're junking up the moon now. <laughs> I mean, where do you have six of them up there? <clears throat> What's another <laughs> 60? I don't know. It's a big place. It's a big place. We got lots of room. Let's junk it. <laughs> <laughs> if there's one thing humans are good at. Yes. Oh. It's, it's leaving electronic waste everywhere. <laughs> yeah. But I think this is just really, really genuinely the most exciting thing um, to really happen in spaceflight. And I'm just so excited to see NASA sprinting right now. NASA is like new blood. They are feeling good. They're feeling their oats and doing some new stuff that that it will avoid some of the frustrations that we had with SLS and Orion. So um, I think this is just a really, really cool, great, great work by NASA. So I One hope this thought reinvigorates I had... people's excitement for NASA and doesn't make NASA seem like this old, out of touch grandpa, you know, mm. your grandpa's space program. I hope this makes people go, no, they're playing the game. They're still in it. You know, they're doing the right moves. I, I'm just super excited. What were you going to say, Ben? Well, just one thought I had related to what Joe was saying a bit about coordination and complexity because, I mean, just obviously I haven't worked in aerospace, but I worked in a lot of industries. And, and uh, whenever you have a lot of different companies trying to coordinate an effort, uh, it, it, it de tends to slow things down because the communication and, and all that, you know. So it, it, that's one thing I hope they can avoid. I'm not sure... Mm -hmm how uh but certainly i would just from a high level guess that spacex has an advantage in that front because to my understanding like they're they're building it all themselves right it's like hey i need to have a meeting with you come here versus right. like oh you want to talk to that company cool well let's go talk to this guy who knows somebody over there like so i think hopefully that'll give spacex an advantage in this whole thing um or it might but you know well, Whoever SpaceX can get us is, there, I'm stoked for. I is, just want my son to be able to see it before he's in high school. <laughs> yeah, that'll happen. Um, I, I think SpaceX is easily the most vertically integrated aerospace company, at least as yeah. far as launch services and all. And I mean, everything else. They build satellites now. They build, they do it all. So mm -hmm. um, even their own life support, they're very vertically integrated. And I definitely think that's um, a very, very good thing these days when, when now manufacturing is so, um, it's so specialized yet, you can buy 3D printers and do all these things. I don't know. It's just it's just a different game than it was, you know, 50 years ago. You can move faster when it when you don't have to ask someone else to do it for you. But at the same time, I kind of I do appreciate the multi contractor approach where we have. Um, it just it leads that whole thing of like, what if one of them gets delayed? What if there's problems with one little subsystem mm -hmm. on one of these contractors' things, and it can just throw a whole wrench in your entire thing? I don't know. It. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what wins out now. Well, so so 
to Ben's point, that's kind of what I was getting at with the my concerns about the multiple contractors and stuff, just communication issues and and delays and whatnot. But I mean, that's it depends what Apollo how they do was. It. I mean, Apollo was Douglas yeah. and Northrop Grumman and Boeing and all these different companies yeah. that I mean every single piece of of the saturn 5 and the command module and lunar module was like held, handled by a different company so even general motors yeah <laughs> right yeah yeah i mean there's yeah every spread throughout the country and this will be a, a good time though we have one company that's working with 24 contractors one that's three and one that's one and we're this will be a great case study to see who gets there <laughs> yes, first. That's actually, that's actually a good point. I, I so, think it's it's how, we'll how they go about it too. You know, I've worked in those situations where like we had a bunch of people from different companies, but we all came to the same building, got together in kind of a scrum room and just coded our hearts out and made something happen immediately, even though it was a bunch of us. And then I've been in other situations where it's like, oh, okay, well, that's a request for them. And there's a formal process for that and yada, yada, yada. And there's all this red tape and just nothing gets done. So right. hopefully these guys can figure it out. That's super exciting, though. You're right. That's awesome. Yeah. Yay, some good news, right? <laughs> we need that. Well, speaking of things Sounds from space. Good. Oh, a yes. segue, I see. Oh. Thank you. And I've been wanting Joe to talk about this forever. So yes, <laughs> yes. Give me the popcorn. I have talked about this, though. Not okay, recently. So, so, so the <laughs> Pentagon like I wasn't listening. verified that those leaked videos from 20 what 17 i think mm. one of them was shot in 2015 but they were leaked in 2017 verified that they're real of ufos for those who don't know where i'm going with this um uh, and um so i've had of course a million people ask me on twitter about you need to make a video about those ufos and i'm like i already did <laughs> and and I and I and I shared on Twitter the video that I had made in response to those you know back then, and it's funny because <laughs> here's let me give the chronology of events of the over the last day or so. I I went ahead and shared that, and I was like, for those who keep asking about it, I did I did you know cover this once before, and somebody responded and said, I seem to remember you saying that after the response you got from that video, you would never talk about UFOs again. <laughs> I didn't remember saying that. But then, like, immediately, Twitter got all Twitter, and <laughs> people started fighting at each other, and uh, people started hating on me and everything, and I was like, oh, that's right. I did never <laughs> I did want to talk that. about this again. That's, <laughs> what a flashback. Is it because it's a loaded, loaded subject with big opinions behind it, or what? For some people, UFOs are kind of a religion. Right? Oh, yeah. Like, for real, a religion. In fact, there's the, was it the Raelians? actually or have they believe in like a an alien god basically or an alien deity i mean that's not too far off from every other religion really right I mean, if you want to go there <laughs> but i mean um some people just take it that seriously and get like super emotional about it and if you don't toe the line and and believe it they just they you know you're basically insulting their religion people yeah. don't handle that very well um but uh so let me just share a video that uh let me let me pull it up here yeah is can you just re-upload that video and like do one of those things where like you just give a new 30 second intro hey guys there's some updates here but i want to share this video from five years ago i did go ahead and check it out and it's like bam you get all the views and everything without having to like do much like it's not bad you know yeah it's not the worst idea if you still i'm sure you still have the same shirt <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> probably wearing it right now um so I actually found this video yesterday from uh, Cool Worlds, which is a pretty great channel. And he did an interview with a guy named Mick West, who's kind of a debunker. So um, look, if, if you're all in on the aliens thing, you're not going to like anything I'm going to say from this point forward. But <laughs> um, he does a good job in this. Uh, let me find some, some pieces here. So, so we've seen, this is the footage. Hang on. Is it? Yeah. Okay. So this is it? this is the footage that everybody was talking about. And um, can you hear what he's saying on here? No. No. no? But I do okay. love the ad on the side. The most realistic virtual lover. <laughs> yeah. What have I been visiting that's giving me that ad? That's what I don't know. <laughs> oh, You've not been I... visiting the place where you sign up for YouTube Premium and not I see those guess. things. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> So the first escaped. thing that he points out on this video is that it's literally like 200 pixels wide. Right. It, it's right. literally a potato. 
yeah. uh, or shot on a potato. Um, but so it's it's infrared, so everything's reversed. The black is actually bright, so that's actually correlated to like jet engines. He basically makes the point that this is a jet, <laughs> but it's just being shot from an angle that makes it look kind of weird. And there's a bit in here where um, where it rotates, and that got a lot of people's attention. So, um, and he's able to go in and use a camera to basically replicate this in his garage. Huh? Yeah. So he's talking about the rotation here. It kind of, you see where it's kind of turning. Sorry for all the people just listen to the audio. So why did the pilots not know what they were looking at? Is this a super telephoto infrared camera that is better it's than Fleer, their isn't eyes? It? I thought it wasn't a camera. It's uh, the something they have on their, what do you, what do you have, an F-35 Super Hornet he was flying? You, the oh, guy I went on Joe Rogan the, for three hours. Was. Yeah, did, did you not see the Joe Rogan interview with the pilot? No. No. Oh, okay. So the actual so tell pilot us, then. Uh, on this mission went on Joe Rogan, talked about it for three hours. What did he have explain, to say about it? Well, he said that, kind of like what people were saying, he didn't know what it was. He cut, he kept calling it a tic tac because it wasn't shaped yeah. like anything, and that the speed. He explained all this footage v- really in detail. And one of the really unique things was like how it moved off screen at one point. He said, "You know, we're flying at I don't know. I'm just throwing out a number like Mach three or something, and this thing just somehow flew off of our screen, and there's just nothing that we we know of that could possibly done that." Like we're, like, we're really good at flying behind things and tracking them, and then all of a sudden it just disappears. doesn't make sense. And so the the flipping of the uh, – how it changes the view of it, the camera essentially, like, like it keeps flipping from, from different um, – uh, lenses, I guess you could think of it, but it's like, yeah. you know, the the infrared to all the other ones. Um, and so he he was saying his uh, the navigator, while he's flying, the navigator is trying to figure out what he's looking at, flipping through him, and he can't make sense of it. And you hear the the voice of the guy explaining that too. So yeah, yeah so he went on there, and he's, I mean, as credible as a person can be. You know, guys like a 25-year veteran of the Navy, like whatever. And this was actually not far. This was off the coast of um, and Sonata, I think, which is like two hours south of where I'm at right now. Mm. Yeah, it's cool. fascinating. Well, I can't speak to that because I haven't, I haven't seen that. Um, but I this can. guy was basically trying to show how he could emulate the same effect just kind of in his garage by like taking a, a lens and rotating it as the, as the lens is focusing and, and changing its uh, aperture and stuff. Mm. So it's producing a similar effect. Uh, mm. And then he talked about this other video here where it's like moving really fast. And um, and basically shows how it's like the same idea as like a balloon. You can see over here on the left side. Like if you're oh if you're traveling one direction and the and the ground is kind of moving the other direction behind you, and you're looking at the right angle, then it looks like it's flying through the air, but it's actually just kind of. I floating. like doing that when you're on the interstate, and if you're on like an off ramp or an on ramp, and the the say the the road curves, and you can stay, look at one pole. At one point, the pole, as you get closer to it, will be going away from you in your perspective yeah. compared to the background. And then all of a sudden it passes and it does this. Like it's perspective is really weird and how it f- like forces with parallax and stuff. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of yeah. weird things like that that just are very counterintuitive just in our daily lives like that. Next time you're on a curve with where you see like light poles or something, look at the background and watch how the light pole will like move in front of you first and then all of a sudden zip behind. It's really strange. Also. Also, keep your eyes on the road so you don't fly off of it. <laughs> yeah, do please. That yeah, too. don't do fixation. <laughs> Not all of us have cars that can drive themselves, Tim. That's what autopilot. <laughs> I don't even have that update yet, by the way. Whoops. <laughs> well, so basically, it, people keep asking what my thoughts are on it. My thoughts are, um, is the whole extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence in a 200 pixel wide video is just not going to do it for me. Um if, if it can be explained away in some other way or reproduced in some way, then it's just not going to be the evidence that, that, that I need. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I would love to see aliens land. I want to be here for that. That would be the <laughs> coolest thing ever. I've wanted to or see the worst. I, when I was a kid, well, I would go outside and look up in the sky for UFO. Like I wanted, I have wanted this my whole life, but you have to apply that sort of rigor to it or yeah. else it loses, you know, I think there's a, there's a gap too of, um, 
the you know Pentagon and then the Navy and then the pilot and all these guys confirming they don't know what it is and leaving that that as a pretty wide open door to being like oh no it's definitely little green men like there's still a gap between those two <laughs> yeah, things of sure. like yes this is footage of something that we took we don't know what it is and it doesn't right. seem to fit with the our understanding of physics and how things work here um yep. So anyways, yeah, but but if people are curious, the pilot went on Joe Rogan and explained it in depth. And, and yeah, I mean, he didn't, from my listening to it, he didn't, I didn't get the sense that he nor Rogan or anyone else came away like, oh, yeah, aliens are definitely real. This is definitely whatever. It was more just like, I don't know what the hell that was. Sure. It's yeah. definitely something that's beyond our understanding, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily, you know, what the Area 51 people are all about. Well, and, and then there are people that are that are like, oh, it might be some secret technology that, that the U.S. government has or some other government might have. And I'm, I'm sitting here like, God, I hope so. If we have that kind of technology. That would be awesome. You yeah, know? I mean, very well could be. You know what I mean? I think it's that, that's where, to me, the, the gap of yeah. like, like, like you're saying, we don't have hard evidence of a thing. We just have maybe the best clue of a thing. I don't know. <laughs> Well, you know what I mean? So you're still kind me, of like up in the air of like, I don't know. L let me speak just real quick to aeronautically. So I, I kind of to echo all the, the idea that like, obviously, you know, we don't, this is n never, can you say this is proof of like aliens as bad as right. all of us want that to be. Aliens. Right. <laughs> it's an unidentified flying object. It's unidentified. We yeah. do not know what it is, but it for is high G maneuvers and stuff. Term. Yeah, exactly. So what people forget is like, you know, pilots can't experience more than a, you know, six, seven, eight G maneuver, and that'd be pretty extreme. You know, for like a sustained period, mm -hmm. if they're tracking something with a really long lens, uh, and it's an uncrewed, you know, unmanned aerial, you know, like a UAV type of thing, some advanced hypersonic UAV or something, that thing can pull insane Gs and literally just go and like be out of the range of a of a scope in an in instant. You know, like literally. It would look instantaneous because it can be so pull 50 G's. Who cares? Like there's no limit to how steeply yeah. you can bank and, and turn you an should go listen, an aircraft like that. You should go listen to the pilot talk about it. Cause he went through all that stuff in great detail. Okay. It, it I, was, should, it's, I should shut up. But, but I agree. It's, it's weird, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's super interesting and I don't blame anybody yeah. for getting excited about it and wanting to kind of get sucked down a rabbit hole. I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to do that. I do too. Um, so, so for everybody who's banging into your keyboards right now, I'm with you. It's cool. It's exciting, <laughs> but let's just, let's just, you know, yeah, let's just <laughs> calm down a little bit. Yeah. That's Why don't you? Just? Well, speaking of not being calm and, uh, a religion, <laughs> uh, well, we're here again, guys. Oh, we gotta Ms. do this. Oh. Yeah, Mr. Musk um, had some. To, are we Musk apologists now? Is that what we have to do? Is I don't know what that means, I but think people seem to think we are. Yeah. What is an apologist? Explain that to me, because uh, when I interviewed Marquez, he said that we. I was asking him like. Can people just start tech channels now? He's like, it has to be so niche. He's like, there's apologists, uh, Apple apologist channels and Apple this. I'm like, I, I was just nodding to try to, uh, you know, be cool. But I had no idea what he was talking about with it, with that. So what is an apologist? Basically, everything they do is perfect. You know, like oh, if you're an okay. Apple apologist, it'd be like, Apple just released the, you know, iPhone 20. And even though it starts at $44,000, it's a great decision. You know, it's the best decision <laughs> yeah. they've ever made, you know. Yeah. yeah. Just or like, like, just like they brought the headphone like, jack back. Finally, I've been waiting for this. I don't know what, who, everyone loves headphone jacks. Whoever right, yep. would want to get rid of that? And you're like, exactly. wait, but last week you were the guy saying yeah. we don't need the headphone jack. <laughs> like, wait a minute. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Got People it. who are not objective. Sure. Yeah. Which is, yeah. I mean, we're all not truly objective. There's no, no real objectivity when you're talking about humans, but... Okay, let's get to it. Uh, Elon Musk last <laughs> night, uh, yesterday on the earnings call for Tesla, um, said that the shelter-in-place orders during COVID-19 are fascist, uh, amongst uh, a myriad of other comments on it. One saying, um, earmuffs, kids, uh, give people back their goddamn freedom. 
Um, and prior to that, was mentioning how the shutdown of the factory in California is a potential serious threat for the company, but they'll get through it. So that's the short version of what happened. Obviously, reactions galore. <laughs> he, Elon Musk on Twitter also, I mean, going down kind of a conspiracy theory rabbit hole now, sharing all kinds of information and stuff that, I mean, some of it appears to be very thought out and other stuff not. I don't know. Like, I did a whole video on it. So you guys can go check that out if you're wondering what I think. Although I didn't really share my thoughts, I just kind of reported on it. But I don't know. What do you guys think about him and these comments about what's going on here? Uh, I'll start off by saying <laughs> that let it's the apologizing okay. first, begin. <laughs> no, first off, we need to make it clear that you can still like someone and think what they're. Someone can be a good person doing generally good things and still be an idiot and doing dumb things. Um, so I I think that's what this is in my opinion. Like I still really like some of the things that Elon does. I I like a lot of things that Elon says a lot. I think he's changing the world in a lot of cool ways. I think he's being really dumb right now, and I think it's. Uh, peddling misinformation or, or ill, ill thought out information because you're probably he's here's what I think is happening. He's probably screaming in his head that, you know, he knows the progress that Tesla has been making and should be making. And, you know, he's watched this ramp and he's been coercing this ramp into existence. And all of a sudden it's being stripped from him and he's panicking because all of a sudden all of his internal everything is like is broken. I mean, I, I know what that feels like because I worked for two months on a video where all of a sudden an announcement comes and my entire video had to be scrapped. And all of a sudden I like literally, I almost stopped and just cried once I figured out what was going to happen. I'm like, where do I go from here? And he probably just has that on a five year scale right now of like, what do I do? And his probably screaming intuition is open the country back up and, and, and some, and letting things feed that, you know, looking for voices of that same, uh, same thing of like open the country back up regardless of uh, what's uh, and not necessarily that obviously there's some truths to that I think you know there's some truths to maybe we're very strict but like I think it's just it's just with someone of his influence right now um, just blanketly trying to tell people that that America is like fascist and uh, that it's against our freedoms all this stuff it's like well hold on now you're going to be feeding a much hungrier beast by doing this. So mm. that's what I think. Fair. Joe? Yeah. I think when he gets a PhD in epidemiology, I will listen to what he has to say about epidemiology. You know, um, <clears throat> if, if I had questions about rockets or electric cars, he is an expert in that. And I, I would value what he has to say in that regard. But, um, you know, and, and kind of to what uh, you were just saying, uh, Tim, I mean, maybe nobody should be surprised that a guy who has $2 billion companies is more concerned about the economy. Mm. You know, I mean, yeah. maybe it's not a surprise at all. Um, yeah. And to be honest, like, I, I, I talked in a TMI video recently about how I have various gnomes in my head, which is just my way of saying I have I'm of multiple minds on, on things, and sometimes I have those thoughts that probably aren't popular opinions, but they don't usually win out in the security council of my brain. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I've had these thoughts that he's talking about and, and the thoughts of like, maybe we should just, you know, let things open back up and I, you know, but ultimately in my brain anyway, it, it com comes out to the sooner we open things up, the longer this is going to go on and the more damage it's going to cause in the long run. Um, yeah. But, you know, here in Texas, actually today they opened everything back up. And oh, right. And Elon tweeted out bravo, I think, yeah. to that, uh, yeah. a news article um, about that. But there, there's also the side of, and I know this is going to sound a little tinfoil hattery, I guess, but I mean, um, especially in, in the restaurant and the service industries and whatnot, um, if they are allowed to be open, then the government is not required to pay unemployment for those uh, employees that have been furloughed. So, mm. so making them go back to work, even though they're only allowed to operate, I think at 25% capacity. And even still, a lot of people aren't going to be going out and sitting in restaurants and wiping their nose on the tables, you know, like they used to, um, wiping their and nose so on the, the restaurants are still going to be struggling 
And so, yeah. so now it's on the, uh, now it's on the business owners to cover the unemployment for these, for these people or mm. lay them off. Like it's, it's basically taken, it's basically the government saying, we don't want to pay the unemployment anymore. We're going to make the businesses pay for it and put the onus on them. And it's going to be even more challenging for the businesses. Mm. Yeah. So there's no, there's no good solution here. I mean, we no, knew that going isn't. into it. This is just going to be bad That's... and it's going to be long. It's going to be drawn out. And yeah. And everybody kind of wants to just kind of, I mean, we, we haven't peaked yet. Right. Like the numbers are still going up. It's starting to level off a little bit, but historically when there've been pandemics and things started to level off and everybody's like, Oh cool. We're, we're good now. And then they opened everything back up and it just exploded again. Yeah. This, yeah. This, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, like everything else. It seems like we just don't learn our lessons. We're just going to keep making the same mistakes. Well, before, I got to jump in before Ben, and then I want to hear Ben's thing. But <laughs> that, that's what kind of scares me the most is that Elon knows and understands exponentials. Like, he talks about it all the time. And yeah. I've always yeah, he's not appreciated a dumb guy. that aspect of that. What was that? He's not a dumb guy. No. And he talks about exponentials and how the growth is so hard to, you know, appreciate in things like ramping up production and things like AI and things like neural nets and self-driving and all these things. And now it's literally screaming at him in the face of like, hey, exponentials, remember us? And he's totally ignoring it. It, it kind of scares me leadership wise that um, he's willing to ignore the science on that, you know, but yeah, there's got to be a solution somewhere between shutting everything down and no one leaving their house for six months yeah. and everyone running around like it's 2019 all over again, you know? Did I tell you about the assistant that I have that lives in the Philippines? I have an online assistant that, that helps me out with things. Um, I don't know if this is still true. I, I could check back in with them, but like they were on when you, we have not been on a lockdown. Like the Philippines has been on a lockdown. They right. had people bringing rationed food to their homes because they were not allowed to leave their homes. That's what yeah. some other countries are doing. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's like, a lot that way, but we're not the there apartment yet. complex I live in. I've seen like two masks so far, maybe. And I look out over the parking lot. I see people just still just hanging out. Like yeah. we've never had it. And we have an outbreak in my county right now, by the way, Tyson meat packing plant. Oh, wow. We have the yeah. biggest outbreak, like literally right here in my county, like five miles from me. Yay. And people <laughs> you are, you guys just... are still above the line. All right. So let me, let me give you my <sighs> thoughts on this. Um, I think from a high level, so I've had a day to digest Elon's outburst, and um, and I've you know been thinking about this a lot, obviously, uh, like everyone has. I, we we were going to get here at some point. I feel uh, mm -hmm. where like the social pressure, societal norms of okay, let's all do this. We're going to crack, and I feel like Elon just blew it open. You know, there have been a lot of people saying this same thing for a long time, but no one gives a crap because they're not Elon Musk. Elon Musk saying that is a big deal. It, it changes people's views. It, it, it emboldens a certain group versus and, and, and kind of depresses another group's opinion. It matters a lot when he says things like this, especially when he goes on tirades about it. I mean, mm -hmm. for him to do it on Twitter is one thing. That's Twitter, man. Go nuts. To do it on an earnings call is bizarre. I don't think it's the right place for it. So I think he he, also, he was he, out of bounds on by doing it on the earnings call. Um, yeah. Other than as it relates to hey the factory shut down because of this, like yeah we all know that we got that. But like giving his voice and opinions, obviously it's Elon. It's what he does. He doesn't give a crap what I think nor anyone else. Fine, he's allowed that freedom in this country, right? Uh, but I knew we were going to get here. And the question I always even going into it thought of was like, would we? So no matter what. There was going to be either the government didn't, they, they underreacted or overreacted. Which one was it? And now we're here at a point where you have people like him calling for this. I've already been a lot of people. Things are starting to phase reopen in California and Texas, et cetera. Things are happening. Um, what, which, which would you have rather had? Oh, it felt like an overreaction or holy crap, everyone really, you know, was hurt because of an underreaction. Mm -hmm. So I think like people try to get really caught up in, What's the right answer? Uh, but I, I don't think anyone 
could I mean maybe in hindsight some person will have pulled some random prediction out of their earmuffs out of, out of their ass and <laughs> and got it right but really no one knows and we don't have the data to make those decisions and we're just so in the dark even still when it comes to actual data to know what to do personally I'm happy that we seemingly overreacted um, and I'm cautiously optimistic that we can start to you know, reopen things or whatever with the right measures in place, which is what we've been doing in wow. here in California. People are freaking out. Our own governor is freaking out, despite all, all the data and everything saying that we're being we're doing it responsibly and doing it fine. Anyways, so that's that's a personal view. But but we we were going to get here at some point where mm. the solidarity started to crack. And the question I just had is, are we going to feel like the government overreacted or underreacted? And which one would you prefer? So. Right. Elon I, I did doing, see, uh, yeah. sorry, I saw an article <clears throat> from, um, I think it was an epidemiologist, but I'm not 100% sure, but they were basically making the point that, like, there's no winning here. Right. <laughs> like, either either a bunch of people die or everybody thinks that we overreacted. Like, there's, there's no way we come yeah. out of this with, like, oh, everything worked the way it's supposed to and go <laughs> humanity. Like, there's, yeah. you know. And see, I think Fauci said, uh, th- if we do everything right, it'll feel like an overreaction. Yeah. Right. Like, that's when yeah. you know you because nothing happened and that's exactly why you react in that way is like to shut it down so that nothing can happen you know and i don't think we're going to call 60,000 or whatever we're at 50 60 whatever we're at like or 30, i don't 60. remember how many uh deaths as nothing <laughs> so obviously our reaction was warranted in what in what we're seeing in the data and the numbers now of course there's all types of conspiracy theories about doctors reporting someone falling down the stairs as COVID and stuff like that, you know, and Elon's kind of peddling that type of stuff. Yeah. Um, that's where I think it's a little out of bounds, right? Yeah. Very out L- of like, bounds. Like I'm totally fine with him having his opinion and, and sharing it and voicing it. However, he feels fine. Um, I think the earnings call is a bit odd. Like that's just not the right place to do that. Like, dude, you literally could just pop open your phone, go live on video anywhere in the world on any platform and share your message just as well. So you don't really have to do it during an earnings call. Just kind of <laughs> d- dilutes the rest of the in- valuable information that's being talked about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> did, did you say in your video that, that his mic got cut off after he started doing that? Yeah, so this was this was me putting on my tinfoil hat because literally the next <laughs> qu- the next question got asked. So so first off, Elon was very calm about the whole thing. I don't know if you if you guys haven't heard it, go watch my video and you can hear him ta- <laughs> say it. And he's totally calm about the whole thing. Um, he's not very heated or whatever. Uh, so maybe he shouldn't do YouTube because he wouldn't be good at it. But point being, <laughs> um, it was very chill how he did it. And then like, you know, okay, blah, blah, blah. Hey, let's talk about profit margins on Model Y, you know, some boring financial thing. And then uh, and then all of a sudden it just goes right middle middle of him talking, just pss, just silence, <laughs> static. And then like a minute and a half of this. And then you hear the speaker come on. So we'll be right back. We're having some technical difficulties. It's like, uh, okay. oh, okay. <laughs> uh, maybe you are, maybe you're not. That's an interesting... Elon's mouth is having some technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, because when he did that before, when he cut off the one analyst and said, uh, you know, bonehead questions won't be allowed. Let's go to YouTube. The stock dropped by, you know, 50 points and the company lost $3 billion in an afternoon. So maybe somebody (laughs) was like, "Uh, hey, oops, Uh, oops, I pushed the wrong button. Whoops. I don't know. (laughs) Let's just save the company a few billion here. Click. Okay, fine. You know, fire me, give me my severance, whatever. Um, (laughs) Yeah, that was kind of a weird thing, but I don't know. That seemed kind of random. Like a week or two ago, there was a uh, a tweet that someone shared, just total stranger shared basically a screenshot of a text message. And it said like, hey, my my brother, you know, who, you know, my brother is a, you know, an EMT. And he just told me that no one's, you know, that they're reporting all people that come in, you know, in a car accident as a COVID death or whatever. So they can get more money. Like that's not a source. That's not a source. That's a screenshot of a text message that anyone can produce. And then to be like participating in that is horrendously dangerous. Like, Did Elon is, share that? He was commenting on it like C or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. See, it's that's where like, it goes a bit. I mean. 
Well, but it goes the other direction too, because there's also a lot of reports of people having strokes and blood clots, and and this this disease is manifesting in ways that we're still trying to figure out. So there might be a lot of deaths out there that haven't been counted as coronavirus deaths because they just didn't they thought it was a stroke or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. We don't yeah. have good data. Is is the deal? To me, well, the whole thing is a data problem. Like, yeah, Agreed. that's. I think in my video that was the one point I had. My 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 stance is we need as many as much data as we can possibly get like tests everything i don't know i don't know how to do that but that would be somewhat of a like it's hard to really move forward to make decisions without a full breadth of knowledge yeah one of my biggest yeah. frustrations through this entire thing i mean from day one has been suddenly people who can't spell the word epidemiology think they're an epidemiologist <laughs> and I'm not I'm not saying that about Elon, but I mean, like, you know, on, on social media and on Facebook and stuff, I mean, like immediately there are all these people like if you have this symptom, you need to do this and breathe deeply and go underwater <laughs> and, and put pressure on your chest. And, and like all these little yep. home remedies and stuff. And I'm like, how about if I get sick, I call my doctor? Yeah. Well, you know, to that point, you know, so they opened up surfing again or ocean activities here recently just this week and first day i'm itching i'm like yes i'm out in the water i'm doing this right um and i posted a photo like hey thank you to our local leaders and our medical experts blah 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 got tons of comments about how could you possibly do that you're an idiot blah 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 i'm like no no how about this i'm listening to the public health officials in my area that are studying this and telling me what's allowed and what's not allowed you know yeah. if you disagree with it go fight with them yeah. But you also were the guy saying, listen to the public health experts a week ago, and now right. they say something that's different than what you originally thought. You're all freaked out. Like, I think people, there's the internet has carried it or is going to carry this on too far in too many different directions. You know, yeah. it's tough. Who, who knows what the right answer is? Let's rely on the people that, I mean, as you've said many times before, Joe, like literally have spent their lives studying these things. Yeah. I, I just, I really hoped at the beginning of this that maybe this would be the the thing that would get us off of conspiracy theories and start listening to experts again. But apparently I was naive about that. So yeah, it's, it's only accelerated all of it. It seems like, all right. So uh, we do have a, why not they just to talk about, but before we do that, let's pay some bills real quick and talk a little bit about Skillshare. Today's ludicrous Ooh. speech. <laughs> today's ludicrous. I'm going with it. Today's ludicrous sponsor is Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning platform with literally thousands of courses from some of the top experts in their fields. So are you guys like me and you're trying to always play catch up? I mean, like last night, I'm like up all night trying to get a script out the door. Yeah. We're up yeah. till 2 a.m. You know, uh, well, maybe yeah. you should maybe I and you and everyone should check out the course on simple productivity. How to accomplish more with less taught by Greg McEwen, the author of the New York Times bestselling book essentialism oh yeah, yeah. i know that how guy. am i doing guys Man, but you're, okay, doing here we go. you're doing great but now <laughs> i'm nervous when am i gonna have time to do that to save myself time we need time now that we're <laughs> at home uh so greg talks about this how to focus on quality instead of quantity how to control your own time spend your energy deliberately and craft an intentional life that works that's something i'm always like i'm trying to be deliberate and intentional with my time and not just get sucked down rabbit holes and you know scrolling on social media endlessly you know uh, -oh, uh this holes. is of course one of the hundreds of courses on skillshare covering everything from business essentials graphic design marketing video production cooking basically if you're interested in it there's an expert ready to teach it to you on skillshare so join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare today with a special offer just for our listeners. Skillshare is offering our ludicrous future listeners two months of unlimited access to thousands of classes for free. To sign up, go to Skillshare.com slash OLF. Again, go to Skillshare.com slash OLF. And for those of you in your cars that just saw some pretty woman walking by and didn't hear me one more time, Skillshare.com slash OLF. Oh, that feels like the most like old school radio. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Skillshare.com slash OLF. That's the get. Skillshare.com. OLF. <laughs> like just repeating, repeating. Also, I do want to say it's probably a good time. I mean, we're still somehow in this ad spot, I guess, because I'm still talking about our sponsor. <laughs> but I mean, I, I feel like genuinely right now would be a really good time to, you know, pick up some new habits and learn something because there's still a lot of yeah. thumb twiddling. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Agreed. So anyway, right. why don't they just learn stuff all the time? Why don't uh, they just? Sorry, I was doing that over you. And that, that was, was so your jingle there. It was so the beautiful. Any version or whatever. So Who today's why don't they just comes from uh, Soccer Man Twelve UK from Discord, one of our Patreon supporters. Thank Sweet. you, Soccer Man Twelve UK. 
Uh, it says, why doesn't NASA attempt to use Northrop Grumman's new mission extension vehicle to attach to Hubble to extend its orbital life? Ooh. This is sort of along the lines of what we were just talking about with all the Artemis stuff, maybe, and the contractors yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. What do you think, Tim? Well, I don't want to answer first. I want to hear Ben and then and you, Joe, but let's start with Ben. Let's go reverse <laughs> order. Yeah. Sounds like a plan. Wait, is Hubble not there anymore what's going on did it have to get locked down too (laughs) (laughs) do we quarantine hubble (laughs) no hubble's there but hubble has a lifespan eventually it's it's gyros and stuff like that will wear out and fade and and no longer haven't we already replaced that once or twice or something there's been some maintenance on it right i remember it was like someone got knocked out of focus originally and then but that was when we had a space shuttle capable of human servicing we haven't right. had a space shuttle since 2011, so the Hubble is just on its, you know, it's whatever legs it's standing on is how many it's got left. So, yeah. Yeah, I wonder if, though, because we've got all these other telescopes that are going up, right? I wonder if maybe end of lifing it isn't, it is the right move. <laughs> so, there have been a lot of space telescopes like Spitzer and the Planck Observatory. I believe that and, one's in space. And James um, Webb. Of course. Well, that's not up yet, though. Oh, yeah. But yeah, yeah. Um, I think I think Hubble's the only one that's that's in the visible range. Am I right about that? I think so. I just Discord? assume if it's in space, you know about it, Tim. So I'm just. Like, well, <laughs> I'm those. Uh, we're getting into planetary science and stuff and astronomy. Yeah, that's yeah. where I. We're we're getting at the end of my Venn diagram of. But yeah, I'm pretty <laughs> sure it's one of the only full blown optical, like optical. Uh, ones that's not pointed at Earth. Like, it's basically a spy satellite pointed the opposite direction. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah, it, it actually kind of passed it, its effective mission timeline a long time ago. Like, it it was not expected to be out there this long, I don't think. Is yeah. there any way we could bring it back and not break it? No. Maybe someday with <laughs> Starship, maybe. <laughs> Potentially. Uh, let's just say no. But yeah, we'll like, like, would it fit in a in a Falcon heavy fairing, and you could just like put it around it and like send it back down, catch no. it with a a net or something? I don't know. <laughs> yes, <laughs> there's no. been more Wiley e. Coyote stuff in space flight. Come on, <laughs> that's not that crazy of an idea. Uh, I think everybody has a soft spot for Hubble and wants to see it up there and keep doing its thing for as long as possible. But it might just be time to move on, you know, get get James Webb up there and. Send Even though it James out to the Webb farm. Is, is a radio telescope, it's not a visible telescope. B- which right. are, I think, far more useful in astronomy. Especially deep And space. also, the land-based telescopes, the big mega telescopes, like the 30-meter telescope that they're working on, um, they have new computerized optical adjustment stuff that can adjust for the atmosphere that can actually do... Uh, they're a lot more powerful than Hubble is. Hubble's big thing was that it was above the atmosphere, and so it was able to get past the distortion and everything. But now they that was all cool until to... Starlink. Duh! I didn't <laughs> scrap those those plans. Thanks, Elon. <laughs> so I was just colliding into it now. Um, <laughs> so I mean, it's just I mean, it's a, it's actually an interesting question: Is Hubble even needed anymore? I think that I question know. would be answered by: Is it still providing valuable data? Like, is it still being booked up by scientists wanting to utilize its time? Is it still valuable in that aspect? And in that case, like, would it, is it, is it still, you know, is it still desirable? Are people still booking time and like excited to use Hubble for scientific purposes? Then, you know, I think it is obviously of scientific value. Yeah. So to answer the question about uh, using like a Mar- uh, mission <clears throat> extension vehicle, like what Northrop Grumman has developed, um, the, the hard thing for Hubble in particular would it be, it doesn't, it can't use just like an off the shelf, uh, mission extension vehicle, which requires, uh, basically grapples onto the engine bell because there's not a, like a large, there's no propulsion engine like that on Hubble. Um, Hubble station keeps using gyros that might have tiny bit of cold gas. Do you guys know, does, does Hubble have discord? Does Hubble have cold gas thrusters at all? I, f- I feel like it, it station keeps purely using gyroscopes. Yeah, I think um, it's just gyroscopes. And reaction wheels. And they keep losing the gyroscopes. Over and there. they keep, yeah, they keep losing reaction wheels. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't think it has cold. So docking to it wouldn't be a completely off-the-shelf solution. So, but maybe, you know, maybe it is something where if it's cheap enough someday and we could send a, you know, yeah. launch a, 
a ride share on a low earth, you know, like a dragon capsule or something, low earth orbit mission that's similar in the, oh, a dragon, I don't know. Some mission, who knows, <laughs> it might work out someday that for $5 million, we could extend it for five years. I think that'd be a pretty big no brainer, but um, what about we'll see because there's a couple lasers. different. What, what Could we just lasers? hit it with a laser? Keep it um, going. Give it LASIK. <laughs> Space <laughs> just LASIK. Keep doing that to no, no, no. Okay, but there's uh, well, Stephen Hawking had a thing a long time ago, right? About um, deploy something uh, to go to Mars, and it's like this giant fan um, mm -hmm. solar thing that that comes out like oh, a parachute, and you hit right. it with lasers from Earth to push it. Light propulsion. Right. Right. Yeah. Now is, I don't know, is Hubble in a geostationary orbit or? It's low Earth no. orbit. No? Okay. It's so low then, Earth orbit. So then I guess, you, I mean, but anyways, I don't know. Miles. There might be other ways. I just like saying lasers. Um, <laughs> but I mean, there might be other ways to accomplish that same thing without having to send up something like that. I don't know. Right. I mean, I, I think potentially especially as this technology proves out and becomes more and more common and more and more companies are utilizing mission extensions instead of relaunching satellites i think in three four years uh north of grumman could easily say hey nasa by the way we can keep that bird of yours going for very cheap you know it might be a no-brainer mm -hmm. so I, I think it could it might just like i said need a special grappler or some kind of different way to interface with the actual satellite but that'd be really cool. <laughs> Are you familiar with this MEV and like what it can do? I mean, I guess what I'm asking is like, could it like dock with it and just stay there and become like a propulsion module for the space station and, or the, the telescope and just move it wherever? Yep. Yep. Wherever That's pretty much what it does. But the, the only thing that I know is that one in particular right now interfaces purely through grabbing onto a large thruster and literally like holding onto the engine bell. And that's how oh. it interfaces because it's the thrust structure of the vehicle. You know, it's designed yeah, to be yeah. moved around by that. Uh, but then again, Hubble was designed to be grappled onto by Canadarm or Canada Arm or whatever. <laughs> so it has uh, some kind of interface. So po potentially, who knows? Maybe so they, they could make a, a docking unit that is that same exact interface. Go up, dock with it, and steer it. That's, that'd be really cool. Hmm. Now, do you guys know the story there behind Henrietta Leavitt in the algorithm and Edwin Hubble? Uh, uh, I'm familiar, but I don't know if I could like recite. She was like the human computer. She was, so yeah, she like, she was the one that created the algorithm essentially to determine how we know where we are in the cosmos. It was something about the lumosity of stars, and it was like in the, oh, the standard candles. Is that what it was? It, it was in, in Harvard in whenever that was, like the 1800s or something. She was one of the women, and women in these days weren't really allowed to work in science. Um, and so it was like they were all deaf. It was really strange. But she was the one that studied this and came up with basically, and, and the reason I know the story is because of it, it goes back to data visualization roots, of her basically graphing out the luminosity of stars that they were, you know, quote unquote, researching. And then from there, that's how she came. She determined how we like an algorithm or something, a calculation to figure out where we live in the universe. Um, but reportedly, uh, Edwin Hubble stole this from her and published it. And then some of the other stuff I read was like, well, he didn't steal it. She, as a woman in the time, would not be allowed to write a research paper. So he actually kind of published it for her. So I don't know what the, the real story is, but if you guys looked into that or... I can't speak to that specific nah, story. Yeah. I mean, I, I could see both sides of it. I mean, if... You, I, you, you could say he did her uh, uh, a favor by putting her work out there in a in a time when she wouldn't able to do it herself. Yeah. Maybe I wasn't around back then, <laughs> yeah, so I don't know anything, uh, unfortunately. But but I mean, Facts I also are a mean, little fuzzy back in those days. It's yeah. not unusual or unheard of for for a boss to take credit for their employee's work because they worked for that person, and so. I mean, look at Edison. <laughs> yeah but right. no so yeah i had to look it up just to be sure but yeah she she created the standard candle metric um that that kind of gives you a it standardized the luminosity of stars so that we can tell how how big they how are how far away they, they are. are how far away yeah. they are yeah exactly yeah yeah and then by knowing how far away they are we can know our relationship to all the other celestial right. bodies in the universe before that it was just dots in the sky 
And after that, right. it was like, oh, well, this one is this close and that one is that far away. And it's brighter and it's different. You know, it's spectrum. brighter and, and yeah, it's it's brighter and, and uh, less bright, darker, <laughs> because <laughs> it's further away. Uh, yeah. Not necessarily because it's actually emitting less light kind of a thing. Exactly. Yeah. And she was brilliant. Right. So. Brilliant. Get it? Bright. Ah. She was brilliant. Shiny. That's how you say shiny in Spanish. <laughs> Uh, okay. What else did we That's have to talk about this language week? Lesson for the day. Did we? <laughs> were we going to be talking about the uh, the old Tesla earnings stuff? Did we even yeah. Talk speaking about of shining yeah, we didn't even cover bright, because of the speaking of, the of shining bright like stuff. a star in the sky. Shine bright like a diamond. Do you ever feel like a plastic <laughs> bag floating what in? Is Sorry, you guys aren't here to listen to me sing Katy Perry. Okay, so show. on the earnings you call, have a vocoder for that. Oh yeah, I do. <laughs> Don't get me started. Don't get me started. <laughs> People get fifteen Guys, minutes to be singing Katy Perry. All I want to do is nap. Like like this. <laughs> no, this is my nightmare. <laughs> okay, so I, and I may do another video on this because basically the earnings call was n- the news about the earnings call was completely buried from Elon's comments about the COVID stuff, um, but they actually did really well. So. <laughs> Go, go Tesla. Uh, they're doing well. <laughs> they showed a $16 million profit. Um, they had record revenues, uh, all this stuff. That really, one of the big ones was the uh, gross margin. Um, so, how, you know, at, before you spend money on other things, just the car itself, how is it doing in terms of profit? You know, 20.6% um, over for, uh, for that's gap gross margin for automobile gross margin, 25.5%. So that's huge, man. I mean, they're killing it. Like every car they're making, they're making tons of money and they're doing really well. They showed a $16 million profit, uh, net income is the term you look for on the balance sheet, which is down quarter over quarter, a huge uh, amount, but uh, is great for Q1 because Q1 traditionally doesn't do very well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, you know, and given the shutdown and all these other things, like something we, we haven't really talked about too is the factory was shut down uh, starting the very last week of Q1. So production wasn't affected greatly. Um, but deliveries also have been shut down for over a month now here in California. Mm. So it it's nuts. Like I've I've been itching to get my Model Y. I literally had, you know, pulled out the cash ready to do all the things and all the things. And it's like, oh yeah, sorry, we can't deliver it. We can't even do home touchless deliveries or anything. So you, you know, that's, that's going to be a huge uh, problem in Q2. Uh, but given all that, they still showed a profit. Uh, they did well. Their cash reserves are up to $8.1 billion. This is largely due to the, uh, I forget what it was, 2.6 or $2.7 billion uh, in, in, uh, in uh, capital raise that they did uh, when the stock was super high in February, I believe. So in terms of um, how they're doing financially, very well. Uh, we'll see how Q2 handles or fares because it's obviously the shutdown is affecting things really dramatically. Um, and so that's going to lead to, to a lot of challenges. Some other little notes here. Model Y deliveries began. We all saw me uh, struggle to do 100 push-ups because of that. <laughs> the Model Y, the You're Model welcome. S range uh, was increased to 391 miles. However, uh, Elon noted that, or <laughs> Tesla noted in the call or in the, the statement here, that it should have been 400 but uh, Consumer Reports, when they did the test, or I'm sorry, the EPA, when they did the test, uh, l- overnight left the door open to the car. And so it went into standby mode and stayed on and lost a bunch of range. Yeah, it's so, 2%. whoops. Or he said so, <laughs> or they left the key in the car and it, and it thought it was, wasn't that it? The key in the car? Like, yeah, right. Yeah. But the door opened, they said, too. Oh, that's So, funny. like, <laughs> okay. Huh, yeah. Um, they also reached production of a, th- a thousand solar roofs uh, per week, which is great. Uh, th- most of those installs are not happening because of the shutdown again. Um, and Model Y really is a, a big, big story here. I think. Uh, let me go down to some of the images they shown. They shown. They showed. First off, the Model Y factory in Shanghai is on its way, wow. uh, getting produced. You can kind of see that highlighted here and what's That's happening. Crazy. So you've got the Model 3 one over here on the left. If you guys are listening, we're looking at basically two parallelograms. Um, and on one side is basically the Model 3 uh, factory, and the other side will be the Model Y. 
So that's coming along. Um, they also announced a couple new things in China, the long-range rear-wheel drive Model 3, uh, which they've discontinued in the U.S. Um, so if you guys want to buy one, I may be selling mine soon. Um, anyways, and then uh, so Model Y's coming there, Model Performance Model 3, long-range rear-wheel drive Model 3, China's humming along. Things are going well there. They also have the battery and module pack, which is coming along um, in China. And then down here, we have some images of... The underbody, this is kind of like the service diagram. If you guys have ever seen any of the Tesla service manuals, this is what they look like. They're showing kind of the skeleton uh, of a Model Y. And on the left, you have the Model 3, where the rear underbody, this is just one example, was 70 different pieces of metal. And on the right, you have the Model Y, where it's only two pieces of metal. And they want to get it down to a single piece. This is part of their whole wild new stamping thing that they're doing. Um, and then they have an image of it here. So this is kind of, you know, this is like when Tim shows off the Raptor engine things. Uh, <laughs> probably less sexy. But um, basically on the left, you have a Model 3 rear underbody, and on the on the right, a Model Y. And remember, these cars are, are almost identical in terms of a lot of these components. I think it was 76% of the components are the exact same or... You, very similar, I guess you'd say. Like like these two things look almost identical on your screen because they they almost are. But of course, the one on the right, the Model Y, is a, a you know much simpler to produce, which re- re- leads to reduced costs, which is how they're showing profit on it. Also, how they're able to produce it much faster. So and cheap, really interesting like, stuff. And it, you know, you can be stronger quality when you cast a, a single piece like that. A lot are uh, you know fewer pieces like that. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool. Yeah, reliability goes up. So. The earnings call basically shown, hey, things are going well, or things did go well. They would have been even better had the shutdown not happened. Um, and then Q2 is they basically removed all their guidance. So typically in an earnings call, you get, hey, this is how we did, and here's what we expect. So so they'll put out uh, guidance, basically forecasts. This year, we plan on making 150,000 cars, whatever. Well, now they're like, yeah, we're just going to take all that back. We, <laughs> we're not providing guidance on anything because we have no clue what the hell is going to happen mm-hmm. from here. And I think that's that's understandable and that's yeah. fair. To me, the biggest news here, though, was the Model Y stuff. Like... Being so, if you guys remember, they they announced the car in March 2019, and they started delivering in March of 2020. So that's one year from from you know release mm-hmm. date to delivery. That's unheard mm-hmm. of. That's crazy. The Model Three was like, like two and a half years. The Model X, well, like like every, they are just really really getting good at manufacturing. Yes. And so hopefully that bodes well for I guess the future of whatever they do. Well, and. They already are profitable on the in the first oh. quarter on a brand new vehicle. That's right. uh, got to be unheard of. That's insane, mm-hmm. and that's with lower sales than they're expecting. Everything. I mean, yeah, when they start employing these better and better manufacturing techniques and all this stuff throughout the rest of their fleet and upcoming products. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Elon says it's, I all mean, the time. He talks about how he's been focusing on manufacturing. That manufacturing is a thousand times harder than. Than the production, or than or right. the, you know, than the actual like design of the the items. Even in, with things like rockets, he keeps saying that, which is hard to imagine. You'd think building rocket would be easy compared to all the little you know components and the crazy science and all that stuff. But he's like, nope, thousand times harder to to manufacture than it is to design it in the first place. The thing that yeah. gets me is when you look at this, and um, I know Tim, you've been to the SpaceX factory, but have either of you guys been to the Fremont plant? No, I have not. So just when I so when you look at this right like so we're looking at an image here of the of the underbody these metal pieces I mean every single little uh dimple in the metal every single little hole every single little mark is for a reason right like right. somebody designed right. that it's not just mm-hmm. like oh let me go like you know copy and paste from this and oh yeah there's all these grooves here we don't need those we're just going to keep them like every mm-hmm. single thing has has an intention and, and was put there for a reason. And then when it goes to building that thing, it, you have to have all the pieces that build the thing also have their own intention. So I just remember going to the Fremont factory, looking at it, going like, my God, like the amount of engineering and planning and design and everything that goes into every single little piece in the car is uh, is mind-blowing, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, if they you know are able to do that faster and better than they ever have in the past, I mean, it's almost. I was thinking about doing a video on this, like the the master, Tesla's master plan part 
Tres is like not necessarily a car, but it's factories. Can they have like a, you know, oh, here's our blueprint for a gigafactory. Okay, here, let me just give this to the guys in Berlin. Okay, well, the land is a little bit different. Let's just survey it, uh, tweak it a little bit. Okay, there you go. Spent an afternoon, and now we have the entire design of a factory. And they can just like churn out factories like they can churn out cars. And then, you know, maybe I'll be wrong, and they will be the only car company around in 15 <laughs> years from now. We'll see. But, yeah, right. I was really excited when I saw that. I was like, what? They, they didn't even talk about this. <laughs> and then the factories become sentient and turn the entire planet into a giant factory and send yep. out von Neumann probes to mm-hmm. deconstruct asteroids. And yeah, There we that's, are. That's, that's, that's phase five. Well, it's like, remember <laughs> uh, iRobot, right? How, like... <laughs> the, the the sentient being determined that humans were the m- most uh, like danger to themselves, so everyone has to just stay inside at their house. I'm like, oh yeah, I guess I guess they were right. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> the safest thing for us all to do is just to stay home. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> oh, was is that is that everything we were talking about this week? There's one more thing I could talk about just really quickly. Just to Ooh, put yeah. out there and start a discussion. We don't have Ooh. to spend a lot of time on it if you don't want Ooh. to, but it's it's worth covering, I guess. Hit me, Big Daddy. Want. So uh, <laughs> the Gateway Foundation had a new mm-hmm. video and a rebranding this last week. Uh, so the Gateway Foundation, they want to build rotating space stations in space, you know, because okay. space... Instead of on Earth. Rotating space stations Good. Right. in Texas. So they renamed it the Voyager Station. It was the Von Braun Station mm. after Werner Von Braun, one of the you know head guys at NASA back in the Apollo days and everything. Um, I think naming it after a former Nazi became problematic <laughs> is probably why they changed it. Um, mm. th- there is a bit of a toxicity around Von Braun's name because he was a Nazi. Which is too bad. And... He kind of got away with not having to, you know, he didn't get shuffled off to Nuremberg or anything. He was given a nice cushy job and we took advantage of what he knew how to do, which was build rockets that once killed people and then got people to the moon. But anyway, so um, that's that's not the whole point of all this. But this is a pretty cool little <laughs> video. It's that, about though. 30 minutes long that they put out. Um, wow. It's titled SpaceX Starship at Voyager Station, but it's not really about the Starship that much. It's basically showing how they want to go about building this thing and it's actually pretty neat they've got these little probes that um i forget what they call this but it's basically the point of this is to find debris because we're gonna be doing if you build this thing um a lot of space construction and there's a lot of chances for little pieces of space debris to float away uh they talk about how you know when uh astronauts are up there doing the the work that like if something is an inch away from your hand it is gone forever Right. You know, mm-hmm. it just floats away and there's no there's no retrieving it. But <laughs> if uh, if you have little probes like this that have, uh, you know, the little thrusters on it and cameras and stuff, it can track all these pieces of debris, go out and catch them. They're developing these robots that can kind of travel around the um, the ship to build stuff. So it's all about heavy construction in space, um, which is pretty interesting. Um, this awesome. is the kind of thing, honestly, that Blue Origin is talking about, you know, moving right. heavy industry up into space. Um, but hmm. I just, I wanted to bring this up because, I mean, these are the kinds of things that we're, we're talking about future wise. And, um, they want to do these rotating habitats. I got to turn this thing. Uh, the, the sound's Man, messing me up. Always spooks um, me out. they want to build rotating habitats to Spooky. provide gravity, some kind of artificial gravity. Oh, here's yeah. Footage here's of the starship. T- the starship docking with it. Um, Sorry for all those who are just listening, but it's kind of cool what they got going on right there. They've got a rotating center core yeah. that stops rotating so that, see, the middle core is like stationary. Right. So right, that you right. can dock with it, and then it's kind of speeds up as you after you dock. Hmm. Can you imagine, like, going from zero G to all of a sudden getting kind of clinged to the wall, and the further out you get, the greater gravity would Oh, yeah, mo- on moving you. out along those... Those the, lateral radial yeah. lines, yes. as the gravity like kicks in as you go up there, <laughs> yeah, increases every every that's, rung basically. That's the uh, the Daniel Suarez Delta V book where I think someone dies because they're doing that. They're like going from one side, one pod to another pod, and a thing like this, and they are in zero g and forget to grab. And as they 
get down, they did weren't holding on to anything, and all of a sudden they just accelerate and fall down and like hit their head on a ladder <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> Well, um, we can put this video in the in the description, the the link to it, or put a That's card up cool. there or anything. It's it's actually pretty neat. They they've they've really broken down the the process that they want to do, uh, that to, that they're going to use to build this by you know like you can see kind of putting spokes together and and then adding wow. modules to live on. Looks it's, like it's just kind of neat wheel. to see that they've thought it through this 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 much. Right, right. It's getting pretty legitimate looking. That is really exciting. I, I definitely want stuff like this in our in our lifetime. Oh, mm -hmm. there! I was gonna say some of the criticisms I've seen for um, for their stations have been lack of solar because it takes a lot of solar and a lot yeah. of radiation. Yeah. Uh, a radiator, sorry, not radiation, but radiators to radiate away the heat. Um, there's a that's why there's such big panels on the ISS for for ra for radiate heat away and you know solar. Yeah. So that looks more like it. That's cool. Yeah. Well, that's that's awesome. I'll have I mean, to watch the whole I thing. Share it. See what you guys thought. That's really cool. Good for them. I'll go. But they've got all the these little, like little escape pods. Uh, little, can you see them around the edge? It almost looks like a coronavirus, doesn't it? Um, but it's got <laughs> these little like Sierra Nevada. Yeah. Um, dream chasers. X thirty whatever dream chasers. No, they're, they're dream chasers. The X thirty seven is a Boeing. Sorry. And uh, whatever you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Space stuff. Come on. That's super cool. Well, anyway, I thought I would share that. I thought, I right. thought that was interesting. Well, that's some good news. I always yeah. like when people start making cool concepts and they start fleshing out a little bit more and looking more and more well thought out. Now, how they're going to fund all that, I'm not exactly <laughs> sure, but we'll see. So, Tim, are you really going to have to redo your whole video? So, what I, I, I cut up, I salvaged what I could out of the 75-minute video and posted that at noon today. Uh, oh, okay. so, got it. So my, my whole video is, you know, basically kind of Starship versus SLS. But now that doesn't quite make as much sense, when, especially when I started talking about the landers and the Artemis program and doing all these things. Um, so what I'm doing is I made it into a multi-part one. So I salvaged what I could, um, made it into the question of, like, why is there both rockets? Like, why, are there, why is there Starship? Why is there SLS? You know, why are they both? Why? How can they both exist at the same time? Like, what are the odds of these two mega rockets? So that's what I could salvage. The rest of it, I can I can salvage all the graphics and all the research and everything, but I'm going to probably have to reshoot almost the entire second half. Um, but luckily, that won't take nearly as long. It'll just take a lot of tweaking. So hopefully, hopefully by the end of next week, I'll have part two out already because it's hopefully done-ish. <laughs> but it's really fun. Just go have a good cry. Go have a good cry and come back to it. Seriously. Ugh. Yeah. So that's what I'll be working on is trying to piece back together the the remaining whatever it'll be another the remnants of your soul the remnants of my soul that that's why really you can't take too long out. to do the video you know you just got to get it out there <laughs> so just make it wrong know. yeah i tried <laughs> yeah cool what are you guys working on that's my strategy just 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 make it inaccurate and wrong and apologize later <laughs> <laughs> don't apologize come on don't ever do that <laughs> oh, ben, what, what is next on? week on on answers with joe Oh, answers with Joe. What happened? Where That's your what do you got? channel. What do you oh, got? Oh, I, thought, I thought Ben was taking it. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, Monday I've got a video on the golden ratio. Oh. A little bit more of a fun one, I guess. Um, it's it's kind of taking the position, not to spoil anything, that it's it's more of just something that we see because we're looking for it. It's not mm. really like some fundamental constant of the universe or anything. But shh. You should talk about the magic ratio, which is of a similar name, but is just uh, a formula for creating good cocktails. And I find <laughs> far more useful in life than knowing anything about the golden ratio. But <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Share it with me after we turn this off because I'm going to need a drink. What is it? One third, one third, one third? <laughs> Shoot, if I had like a, a thimble of feet. alcohol right now, I would pass out. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, yeah, I'll share it with you. Well, cool. Yeah. So and I don't know what I have. Oh, next week I have a uh, video, and I actually need to ask your guys' help with this, is a um, if you could only have one electric vehicle, which one would it be and why? Hmm. And so I, asked, you answered, I, I you go answered through mine. my choice. I go through the past, present, and future of EVs that we know of, not concept cars, not weird James right. Cameron Avocar things, but real <laughs> 
real EVs. Right. Um, and then I asked a bunch of other YouTuber friends, and so I've just got like a little montage of everyone, just like, what would be your one EV if you could only have one? Cool. It's awesome. I'm guessing you guys probably already own the one that you would have. Yeah, I'm kind of fine with it. I, I think mine would be the Y. I think that is a little more oh, practical. Right. I would so Not the I, I, I will someday, but I'm gonna wait on that for a little bit. So Roadster with SpaceX package? Yeah, obviously. Most practical <laughs> for me for sure. Gotta fly Can you get over a cyber my truck house. with a roadster that just kinda like comes out the back. <laughs> <laughs> I replaced the cyber quad with with a roadster. Yeah. Roadster. That quad. thing looks dope. Hey, we didn't mention Ooh. really quick though that Elon said that uh battery day might be third week of May. And that um, cyber, we'll see some updates later this year, I think, on semi roadster. Roadster and Cybertruck. And Cybertruck. Or not Cybertruck. I think they just said semi and roadster. I was hoping we were going to hear some of that on the call, but uh, I didn't I didn't get any any notes on that. So, yeah. You know, it is 2020. Else. Dude, it, it went sideways quick. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's a bummer because I think we could have got much more information. He still could have done that same thing. It had he not done it there, but whatever. He does what he wants to do. Yep. So he definitely awesome. does that. That's awesome. Cool. Good old Elon. Well, we'll see you <laughs> in our, in our in ludicrous, ludicrous future. future. Hey, thanks so much for listening. If you like what we do and you want to kind of help get it out there, uh, you can give us a nice review on any of your podcast streaming platforms, whichever one you use. That kind of helps get it out there. Also, we do have a Patreon set up, uh, so you can join us there at patreon.com slash ourludicrousfuture. You can get your name in the credits. We made a whole other group of like-minded people. It's a lot of fun. We do appreciate it. We'll see you there. Thanks.